and have the hour right now. So um, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Clancy Poole and I'm a branch manager at the Whitman County Library, which is in South Eastern Washington. We kind of border Idaho, our county does. And um, we're a countywide district with exception of the largest town in the county that uh, has a city library and also is a college town. So we serve about um, 14,000 people. My town population is four, 525, but I consider my service area to be the school district, which is population around 1,000. And uh, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, used to be full-time for the district and now back to just being the hometown librarian, which is part-time. And CJ, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. C.L. Quillen from the Spotswood Public Library in Spotswood, New Jersey. We are a standalone municipal library in the central part of New Jersey. Um, the community population is about 8,400. Um, excited about this today. You went quiet at the end. Oh, sorry. I'm um, just very excited about, it seems like my, I'm getting a message my internet connection is unstable. So if I cut out, I apologize. Um, yeah, just excited about everything that we're doing here today. And the ARSL roundtables have really been very helpful. Everybody's ideas. Um, I asked Nicole Kopp, who is our, uh, well, let's see, she's our STEM, STEM educator. She's our teen librarian. She's our main contact with our 12 different school districts that we serve. Uh, in her spare time, she does lap sit baby time weekly. So, you know, just sort of your standard <laughs> rural librarian. Um, and she did a project this uh, last month where she coordinated with um, an engineering firm that we have to send out brown bags with four different ones for elementary schools with materials for STEM experiments. And she was, I know she's here. Hi. Nicole, there you are. Ta -da. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so as Clancy said, we partnered with a local uh, power protection company by the name of Schweitzer Engineering here in Washington. Uh, they came to us, said, how can we help? And at that time, we didn't really know because we had just closed our doors. We didn't know what we needed or, or where we were going or what direction the schools were going. Um, we then came up with the idea to provide STEM kits to all of our service area schools, um, which is about 11, I believe, in our service area. And that's over a thousand students. Um, the company I partnered with really wanted to make sure that um, equity was addressed and that um, I was really strongly feeling that as a parent, as a mom during this experience, um, we wanted to make sure that the kids were provided with all of the supplies that they needed for those kits. Um, so we came up for, with four kits. Each student would receive two kits. K through three had a marble kit and a pencil kit. And uh, four through sixth graders received a popsicle stick kit and a straw kit. Um, very easy supplies that they received. Um, nothing out of the ordinary pencils clothespins, that type of thing, but we assumed nothing. We didn't want to make that assumption that they had that available in their home or that they could go to the store and receive it. Um, so we provided them with a kit that included the activity sheets and the design process. Um, we wanted to kind of walk them through the experiments that they were doing, um, but not provide them the answer and not provide them the pictures unless it was absolutely necessary of the end product. Um, so, for example, in the marble kit, the kids are creating a marble maze using a nine-inch paper plate, 
some construction paper, they're getting the marbles to um, create the maze, and they're experimenting, you know, what worked the best? Redo it, have, have your siblings try it, have your parents try it, and, and kind of get in them to question and, and um, do some um, troubleshooting and find out what works the best for them. They were also given an experiment in that kit to um, see how energy transfers from marble to marble by placing the marbles on a ruler, wooden ruler, and flicking those marbles and then testing to see um, how the energy transfers from one marble to another. So we gave them all the instructions, but we didn't give them the answers. Um, we wanted them to find out on their own. We did ask them that they send pictures and videos of themselves doing the experiments. And um, then SEL, the company we worked with, um, they offered another prize package for those kiddos that sent in pictures. Um, and so we just had our first winner from that, so we'll be honoring her later today. But um, it was really important for us that they received all the instructions, but they also had the internet resource to go to. So we listed all the resources where all of our activities came from, um, so that if they did have that available to them as an opportunity, they could go online and take a look at those. Um, and then they could go back. Um, and if they didn't have internet access, that was okay too. Um, but we offered over a thousand kids received our kits. They were distributed through the schools. So whether it was via lunch program, um, them taking them out on the buses and dropping them off with the kids' school lunches, or whether they did a drive up situation where they had them on the school bus and the parents just drove through and they dropped them into their window. Um, that's pretty much how we uh, distributed those kits. Clancy, was there anything else you wanted me to touch on? Well, just, and now we're kind of following up, trying to catch all our homeschool families. Right, right. So we had a private donation um, because what happened is, of course, um, we rolled out our first phase of this project to four schools, and then all the other schools were worried that they weren't going to be included. Our intention was always to include all 11 schools. Um, but we wanted to really start out a little bit smaller with schools that had given us good response in the past um, to make sure the project was really successful and we worked on issues that we may have had at that point. Um, so we got all kinds of phone calls like, what about our school? What about my kids? What about our homeschool kids? What about our Catholic school kids? What about our um, different schools that, you know, we, that were in the area um, that we don't service, but they're still in our county? Um, and so we threw it back out there that um, if anybody was willing to donate additional money, we would be more than willing to come back and, and fulfill more kits. So now we've done um, a little over 100 kits that we'll be doing for homeschool kids in our area as well. And I guess the other question is, Nicole, uh, what was your budget? I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But so what, cost per kid <clears throat> yeah. or... Yeah, that was the other thing we wanted to make sure is that um, the cost was, even though SEL was giving us the money, um, we wanted to make sure that the cost per kit stayed pretty low. So it was $3 per kit is what we made sure. Um, and then the library kicked in the photocopying um, cost because, you know, we did a little bit of that. They recouped us for some of that cost, but um, we felt that was part of our partnership that we could something we could offer. So we probably did, I would say we're a little over four thousand dollars into the project. Anyway, I, I asked Nicole because I think the fact that we were so conscious of being able to serve kids without digital options and not exclude kids that do have digital options really made it a, a great project for our diverse county. And I know I had people calling me because my district was one of the ones with a history of working with the library. And so we were kind of the test <laughs> area and um, neighboring towns. And, you know, we got, and we got excellent PR coverage from Spokane, and which is our largest nearby city, which just demonstrated that we're out there doing stuff. 
Um, so I'm going to put on the listserv after this closes a description of everything that went into one kit because uh, it includes some PDFs and stuff. And then if people are interested, just kind of comment and I can add the other three kits. And <clears throat> there's a supply list and kind of a picture of what things look like and the handouts. So I just think it's a way to get started either here at the end of the school year or for, it has some great ideas for behind the library pickup, which I think most of us are going to for summer reading. So does anybody have any quick questions for Nicole? Either just turn on your mic and ask. Okay. And right, I'm seeing a lot of people posting in the chat about offering Wi-Fi in their parking lots, um, offering the ability to sign up for e-cards online, um, offering craft projects, and um, putting extra money into Hoopla, Overdrive, and other online services. Looks like somebody else put their instructional videos on their local community television channel, which is great. Okay, um, now we're kind of wanna open it up to see if anybody wants to share something they've done or how they've targeted different demographics with non-digital uh, services. I saw someone posted something on the listserv because they don't have browsing when people can't come in is they're going to put tables in front of their windows with like all the new material set out so people can window shop at their library. So Does anyone want to talk a little bit more about uh, something that they brought up at the chat? Maybe uh, expand a little bit on how that process was for you? I'm particularly curious about the the local community television channel. I don't know if Amelia is able to expand upon that, but trying to work out creative partnerships right now, especially in areas where people are working from home or on very limited capacity. And of course, with the same fog we're all experiencing, you know, how do you broker those kinds of deals? Um, Amelia or anyone else is, yeah, great. Thanks, Amelia. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we've had a good relationship with our local community television channel for a while now. They actually come in on a regular basis to the library and film interviews with um, community organizations. So like us, uh, the churches, Parks and Rec, that sort of thing. Um, and so I reached out to them and said, hey, I know you don't have any events to film or hype or you know and with with meetings being virtual it's a little hard to film say the local town hall of whatever so um we've had a staff member put together tutorial videos they're only about five to ten minutes long i think one of them was a little bit longer on how to gain access to rb digital to hoopla that sort of stuff um, and it doesn't really help people who don't have internet access at all. But for those who have data plans, because I know one of my staff members, she doesn't have internet, but she's got unlimited data on her phone. So she can download the app using her data plan and gain access to the content that way. Um, 
for others who don't even have that, they could come and, um, you know, maybe come to our library and we've expanded our Wi-Fi um, area of reach so that they can come and download books and then take them home and read them that way. There was a question, Amelia, about where, what your service population is, and I'm curious about where you're located too. Um, so I am the adult services department head for Salem South Lion District Library, which is about a half hour north of Ann Arbor in Michigan. And service population, I mean, we're, we're a little bit on the big side when you talk about rural and, and um, small libraries, but we do serve a population of like 15,000, I think, somewhere around there. So we're a district library, so we have a lot of smaller areas that kind of convene into one. So it kind of depends on if you're looking at contract area versus service population of the ones that we have an agreement with, and it gets a little confusing. We serve um, three communities in three different counties. Well, and I know our Wi-Fi has always extended outside of our buildings at least a little bit, but um, it's varied because of the construction of the building and parking. And like I said, the city's own the buildings. So we are attempting to expand that at least some. We're also looking at um, putting Wi-Fi locations in some of our unincorporated towns you know, like at the church or at the community building or someplace like that. We can get money to do that. It's a matter of finding the right person who's willing to let us use their building and their parking. And hopefully that will work out because we probably have another, even though we have 14 branches, we probably have another 10 unincorporated towns that don't have a branch and um, and a data plan will get used up pretty fast if uh, you only have your phone and you have six kids or that kind of thing so we're hopeful we can get that worked out is anybody else extending their wi-fi in other locations hmm. Jenny, do you want to talk some more about some of the services that you're offering? Because it seems like you guys are offering a fairly extensive uh, set of services there. I've been watching what you put in the chat. Or sorry, I was shoveling in a sandwich because I hadn't had lunch yet, so I didn't want to be showing my face while I ate. Um, uh, <clears throat> the notaries was the biggest challenge. We were trying to figure out how to do that. Um, we happened to know the two patrons who needed it, so we already know who they are. Um, which was helpful and we thought how can we do this so we just had them text us a picture my phone's cell phone number's out there anyway in the world so they texted me the photo and i showed it to our notary we have four notaries on staff um and then they were able to notarize the documents and get them back out to the patron through our curbside service um and we've been also, of course, doing the curb, we've been doing the curbside all along. So we've added the laptop service and the printing services to that since we started. Um, we we sanitize the laptop before every checkout and when it comes back and they leave us their car keys or a driver's license just as our deposit for having the laptop at the top used in the parking lot. Um, we did that this morning for a guy who was super happy. He needed to print something quickly and so that all worked really smoothly and he was in and out in 50, I mean, in and out of the parking lot in 15 minutes. Um, so I, I don't know what else there is to say about it. Our, we're excited about the summer reading program going through our summer lunch. Um, we have, we partner with multiple people for that summer lunch program. Our, the city does the program, not the library, but the library always offers, um, every year offers at least one day of activities at that program each week. So being able, and we've brought that program to them. Now our online services, um, the virtual, I know we're talking more about like, how can we reach people that we don't necessarily serve online, but we did, we've been starting with our guests, um, having guests and we had a tippy toes dance group, which is a local dance group 
um, do a performance online in Zoom for us. And we had over 40 people attend that Zoom night, and including someone out in um, Portland, Oregon. So that was kind of fun, who, whose cousins were dancing in Iowa. Um, so that was pretty cool. <clears throat> so I think we're pretty excited to, I know that some people are concerned about the investment of doing the online programming with guests, but it, so far for us, it's been really, we've found that those have been a big draw. I don't know. That's about all. We did a jewelry making and now we're doing a painting program too online and those are both sold out. So for adults. Are you offering the supplies, Jenny, or are they have yeah, they have the supplies up, on there? Picking up, they pick up the supplies through curbside. Um, if they can't come in, we can mail them. If they can't get to us, we're, we're willing to mail too. But so far everyone's just picked them up by a curbside. Annie, do you want to talk at all about the grant that you were able to get? That's really impressive that you were able to get a grant in such a, you know, while this has all been going on and, and actually be able to get this up and running. Um, well, it's, it was a little complicated. It was the, um, oh my gosh, who put the grant out for expanding Wi-Fi? I can't think of the name. If, if it was IMLS or, I think it might have been IMLS. And um, the problem for me was um, that I got, you know, I talked to the other libraries, I, I talked to the, uh, who, the fire chief who was really into this idea. And um, for some reason, even though I am completely surrounded by libraries that are uh, considered rural, and I, we have a village of 1700 people, I am not considered rural. So when I put in the application, yeah, uh, and everyone at every stage, this has happened to me, every person I've ever talked to said this doesn't make any sense. I'm hoping that with the new census, it will get straightened out. But anyway, so I put in the application and was rejected. Um, but then one of the other libraries was able to submit it. And so um, she's kind of taken it over and um, she got the equipment and um, some money for, you know, there's always bits and pieces you need for installation. But the grant application itself was super easy. Um, and I, you know, there were great partners available. So that was a nice little win for our area. We were able to put up a Wi Fi station in um, an area that has just the worst cell phone and um, internet service around. So, um, you know, all credit to the um, fire chief for jumping on board with that and being willing to have people in his parking lot, uh, you know, at any hour of the day or night. So someone just asked me in the chat about performers um, coming into the library. We are not having performers in the library. They're working from their studios or from home. Um, right alongside us. We have staff in two teams that working from home um, on the days when we're in the library. We, we alternate days um, of work from home. So that's worked really well for us. We've had yoga studio, people in a yoga studio doing yoga for us with our kiddos. And we did, we had four staff socially distanced in our programming room doing yoga alongside them. And all the kids were from at home though doing that. So that's worked really well for us. And I do want to say we had an adult program um, with with our book club and um, one of our staff hired a llama to come in to the room, Zoom room in a unicorn. They had a unicorn horn. His name is Earl and he's amazing. Um, he's been going about the community. He'll come to people's houses for a donation. So one of our staff donated money to surprise our presenter who was one of our other staff with the llama in the Zoom room, which was pretty amazing and funny. <clears throat> it looks like another question about the yoga, whether you're offering it live or recording it. Ours was live. We have a we have a yoga instructor that uh, two of our staff have gone through her youth yoga training program to be youth. I'm 
muted. Um, sorry about that. Ours was a live program. Um, we have a yoga instructor who we've worked with for a few years who has instructed two of our staff to give the, to get youth training certifications for yoga. Um, they both, they've both been through her weekend program, a weekend intense weekend program to do youth instruction. Um, so she came with her daughter into their studio and did it out of Illinois. She doesn't even live in Iowa anymore. She just did it for us out of the kindness of her heart. So. Yeah, um, I know our Tai Chi instructor works in partnership with the hospital. And even though she's continued to do Zoom Tai Chi, she can only do people, uh, she can only admit people that have already given her a release by virtue of what the hospital requires. And so we haven't been able to advertise that in the same way. Has anybody who's doing exercise classes had issues with getting releases? And, and in her case, they didn't want her to do films because they wanted her to be able to see if somebody fell or something like that. They wanted a live performance. So I was just curious if others have worried about that or, you know, I think a, a hospital is probably more cautious than maybe a library <laughs> would be, but uh, just curious if you're offering exercise that way, if mm -hmm. you're wor doing releases. We have not done releases. I, I think of it as just like YouTube. Um, there's programs available all over online that people can do free exercise out of their homes. All, you know, so I, I always think of it like that. It's just, so we have not done those when they're working out of their own home. But I, it's, a, it's definitely a thought. I hadn't, something I hadn't thought of. I know our rec center is just starting to do some, some programming, um, online virtual programming. So I'll have to ask them what they're doing. Dennis, do you want to talk at all about um, hosting those Zoom-based meetings? Are those outside organizations that are using your Zoom account? So my name's Dennis. I'm from Bridgman, Michigan, over near Lake, well, near a stone's throw from Lake Michigan. Um, so yeah, I, basically what that has looked like at this point is um, so any, virtually anybody in the community whom I hear in one way or another that they're host that they're providing some meeting some something, you know, program or whatever, um, virtually I'm just offering on behalf of the library to host it via Zoom. So I hosted our friends meeting um, recently. Um, our yoga instructor. Um, so I understand that she is using the free version of Zoom to host her programs. And so, you know, I'm checking in with her. I have a couple of staff members who actually have attended her live when she was doing, of course, live programming in the library, they participated. So, you know, they're, they're able to give very um, fresh feedback on how well it's working. And so, I mean, it seems to be working fine, but yeah, you know, I've kind of looked at this as an extension of what we typically do in terms of you know pr providing space for people. It's just a virtual space now, and so I'm I'm being I'm just being proactive with people. So there we have a group um, that has met in the library, a, a book discussion group that's very popular. It hasn't been hosted by a library staff member; it's a community member, but it's been going on for years, and so I'm. They're, they've skipped one meeting I offered to host via Zoom and there are some other challenges that they were a little reluctant to to have us host that program for them. But, you know, I'm still kind of nudging them a little bit like, you know, we can we can figure this out. Um, so it really isn't, hasn't been anything formal, but, and so I'm actually new to the community. I've, I've been the director and so in, in Michigan, we're a class two library. So our service population is around 7,000 people. And we contract for library services with an out, a township um, outside the primary service area too. So, um, so 
you know, when I'm, when I'm hosting, um, yeah, I just view that as a part. So I see a question in the chat. Well, I'm the only one who uses the account. I mean, I host. So, um, so I don't know if any of you are looking at, at Amelia's comment in the chat about Zoom's user agreement that limits the account to one person. As long as I'm hosting, I'm, I haven't been concerned about that. Although, I mean, I appreciate people asking because sometimes somebody will ask the questions that I haven't thought of yet. Um, at this point, I feel okay about continuing to do this as long as, so I don't give my password out to anybody else. I don't, I mean, I'm the one who hosts. So, you know, I do offer, offer this um, as a, well, recognizing that, uh, you know, I'm attending the meeting or I'm attending the program or I'm, and with the yoga, I'd be doing the same thing. I'd be, I'd be in attendance as it were. And, um, Again, so that might be in a regular operating world, there are certain programs I would attend anyway. I mean, if they were in person, I'd be attending anyway for a variety of reasons. And at least at this point, I haven't, I haven't felt inclined to think any differently about this kind of offering. That's a good question though. I mean, I, and Amelia's comment there, um, as I say, at this point, because I'm the one who's hosting, I felt like it's okay. Somebody might tell me different at some point, but at this point, that's my that's my perspective on that. Well, and our IT department has been busy adding a camera to one public computer in every branch, assuming oh. that yeah. Zoom meetings may be how a lot of things will be going even after this. So it would allow people to come in and use a headset and mic. I mean, they don't have total privacy, but uh, because we don't have private viewing rooms, but we sense that a lot of education is going to happen that way. Yeah. And since our laptops generally don't have cameras, at least the ones we lend out, um, we have decided to just add one of those, I don't know, $100 cameras, yeah. mic included, if they want to use that, um, to one public computer in each branch, possibly two in one of our bigger branches. But I think in the future, that's going to be a big way to serve people yeah. who digital access may just be the data plan on their phone. Yeah, I think that is really interesting. So. So I have, um, I've set up, I've, I've, I've made sure that um, our networking functions in terms of communicating with the public computers and that sort of thing can help facilitate communication back and forth and screen sharing and, and that's, well, not really screen sharing, but our, our, the staff being able to virtually, you know, screen projecting, I guess, is a better word to describe it, but actually putting cameras on some of those public machines. I hadn't thought of that. That is a very, because that would really help facilitate that, that a higher level of communication. That is a really interesting idea. I've, I've made a little note about that, Clancy. I appreciate you sharing that. And I think job interviews, we, we sort of lumped mm -hmm. it under our, uh, we think there'll be more virtual job interviews going forward. And so, I, I'm not quite sure of how the whole budget worked out, but I know part of it was in in our uh, work search development that uh, more and more uh, those kinds of virtual things are going on. So um, I think it's something for other libraries to at least look into as a possibility. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. There's a couple questions about noise from people being at the public computers. Um, so I don't know if anybody's figured out a way around that, but I do think that, you know, as this goes on, depending on how long things continue to have an effect on our libraries, we may have to look at getting creative with our spaces.
I think the, our plan for now, as far as noise, would be to allow people to use, I think we'll start with their own headsets with mics, just because, you know, something, <laughs> keeping that kind of stuff clean when it's on people's bodies. Um, I also, in the past, if people were taking classes or tests, they could schedule a time when the library was staffed but not technically open. So like in our main branch, most of the staff arrives at eight and we don't open to the public till 10. So people were able to, through prior scheduling, make arrangements to come in when the building was quiet. And I, and, um, I think that's something that we'll probably at least look into for all our locations kind of depends on the setup with each town but um, I was concerned too about the if you're doing a, an interview and everyone in the library can hear but what they say and little kids running behind you and I think with the rise of zoom meetings people are more used to that my doggy door slamming when I'm not muted but um, I think thinking about those kinds of privacy things is going to be important too. And there's a comment about using laptops and scheduling your meeting rooms to use for those virtual meetings. This is Patty. One of the things that I have uh, uh, recommended to the libraries that I serve is being able to set one of those steadier meeting rooms up for telemedicine appointments. A lot of our a lot of our counties don't even have a hospital, um, so that's one of the things that uh, most of our libraries are not using their community spaces for meetings or anything, but they are planning to reserve that and checking out a laptop. Um, for those folks to be able to have those private appointments. Yeah, that's a great service, Patty. I'm sure that a lot of people are really going to appreciate that and want to take advantage of it. Anyone have any other ideas that they want to share about um, services that they're, or ways that they're coming up with new ways to provide services? Are there any partnerships that anyone thinks is particularly unique that they've been able to secure right now? Um, at least for our summer reading, I'm located in Michigan, so I know a lot of our um, local businesses have been kind of hurting as far as um, um, just having people being not able to come in the door with just curbside and those types of services. So we've partnered with a local coffee shop that has um, donuts and different pastries as well for one of our summer reading prizes. So I'm gonna print out um, a certain amount of coupons with numbers on them and the owner of the coffee shop was willing to keep track of how many of those get turned in. And we're, of course, we're gonna foot the bill for those because of um, the economy now. And um, I just thought it was a nice partnership and also to give them some extra business as well. Yeah, I've done the coupon thing in the past and always asked businesses to donate, you know, 20 ice cream coupons. This year I'm going to at least give them the option of some sort of a payback. I'm hopeful at our local coffee shop, I think I pay, arranged to pay them $1.50 per drink, which is more like their cost. 
as opposed to what they would sell at retail. And so, and we are not doing our usual uh, solicitation of donations campaign. I'm gonna be taking around uh, summer reading supporter signs to all businesses that contributed last year, this year, have a history of contributing just to, as a thank you to them rather than uh, singling some out that just can't donate this year. So I think that helps. And Nicole's project, we've always had a few school districts that weren't really partners. <laughs> I don't know how to better say that. We, we offer them things and they just are pretty much not interested. But the demand for these STEM bags after some school districts got them really encouraged uh, administrators to follow up with us and we hope that going forward we'll have better partners uh, in all our school districts. Jessica, did you want to talk about the um, PLA Google grant and how you're going planning to uh, work with small local small businesses? Sure, absolutely. Um, that grant um, I saw come up in my email one day and it's the um, the PLA is joining with Google. Uh, will Google support um, to give out these grants to help either local small businesses or helping people find jobs. And I really wanted to help our local businesses. And I had, I just had no idea exactly what their needs were though. Um, and before we shut down, I have our local BNI chapter. Um, they meet every week at my library. So I actually just decided to reach out to them to see um, what what they need because they would be the best people to know and so we've been wor actually working together together for the last two weeks just brainstorming um ideas and they've reached out to um other business other local businesses that they know to really find what their concerns are um so we're gonna uh, apply for this grant offering a couple webinars and then using that grant money to really give one-on-one -on -one help because as much as um, the workshops help, we think that special one-on-one -on -one, um, help will, will even be better for them. Um, so it's actually been a really great partnership. Um, they're excited uh, that I reached out to them. I'm excited for their help because I really wanna um, be able to use the grant um, to really focus on the needs um, that our local small businesses have. Anyone else doing any services with local small businesses that they want to talk about how they're doing that or what they're planning to do? So a couple things, one small business and one not. Um, we do a program called BYO Book, which is bring your own book at local bars and restaurants where we have our book club at the restaurant or bar and we bounce around and we always purchase the first appetizer. Um, everybody is responsible for their own beverage of choice and anything additional, but we purchase an appetizer and it's to get the business back into the restaurants. Um, we've been doing that forever. So since we can't do that now, we're doing Zoom meetings and we're selecting a restaurant to be part of that as well. And um, encouraging people to go to a specific restaurant for the evening and buy, buy locally. Um, and then inviting the restaurateur into the into the Zoom meeting if they want to come in, not to talk about their restaurant because we don't do advertising, but just to be a part of it, um, to see that we are making that effort to reach back out and be a, an equal partner because um, we typically go asking for donations and handouts. Um, we're asking them if they want to give a little discount for the evening or whatever if they mention the book club, but we haven't. Uh, and I don't know, it's not done yet, so we'll see how successful it is for the next book club. But um, and since we can't, um, we aren't ordering books through interlibrary loan for the book club right now, we are purchasing and giving the book as part of the book club. So to everyone who joins, signs up to be in the book club gets the book for free to keep. And then we ask them to pass it on to someone and share it. So um, just ways to get through that. The other thing that I wanted to share that we just started with a couple of weeks ago was 
Um, we had someone call and ask if we were providing masks to community members who didn't have a mask, a cloth mask. And I was like, no. And then I thought, why aren't we? So we put a call out on our Facebook page and we've gotten probably four or five dozen masks donated so far with another call that someone wanted to donate ear um, things to help with the ears. Um, we started doing that program last week and we've had about a dozen masks given out to people in the community and everyone has been so appreciative. We're, it's a chance for us not only to encourage people to wear masks and to provide information on the, the purpose of the masks. So we're, we're debunking some misinformation about masks, um, giving someone a mask if they don't have one. And we talked to one guy who said he had been afraid to leave his house because um, he didn't want to go out without a mask. So how cool is that? Um, it's just, it's a really easy program. Uh, just to share with everybody, if, you, if it's something you can do in your community, um, we are going to require them when we reopen. So figure it's a good start to that. Colleen, do you want to talk about your book club? It looks like you got the author to join you. Yes, we did purchase um, because uh, our we're part of, oh, okay, so I'm in Southwest Kansas, part of a library system, and Kansas is really awesome about um, interlibrary loaning and sharing books, and so when we shut down, um, we didn't have uh, the current book for um, for the book club, so um, we asked the li I got to select the book and I sent a, an email to the author and she said yes immediately. She was very responsive. Um, the book was actually Big Lies in a Small Town and the author was Diane Chamberlain. It's always great when you're able to um, get the, the authors to participate. I know uh, here our consortium, we're in a consortium of 33 libraries and we're planning some virtual authors at home kind of presentations in the next couple of months. And that's so much you know, easier as a small library to be able to participate in something like that. It's, it actually is a really good opportunity because we couldn't get you know, a, a fairly well-known author given the size of our library to come in person, but being able to be part of something virtual makes that more possible. Don, do you want to talk at all about, um, I, I see you've posted in the chat about uh, the Chamber of Commerce and um, local libraries supporting local businesses and do you have anything you want to add? Anything else anybody wants to talk about? Uh, this is Dennis from Bridgman in Michigan again. One of the things that I've been thinking about, so we in Michigan, I think, are very fortunate to have a very proactive um, state library. We meet weekly, we, so we've been very well supported, I think. Um, and so low, more regionally, there, there were seven of us libraries in not exactly in our in Berrien County, a county that my library is located in, but close enough. Um, and so, the governor, we we do we are required um, by executive order to develop and have board approved um, basically reopening plans and a reopening policy. I mean that's not. It, the wording isn't exactly right, but I mean, ba so basically, we have these documents that were required um, to have um, in place and available to the public. And so, um, we, and I, I think it's fair to say, we, most libraries in Michigan, I think, have either have them in place now or have been working really hard on these plans for you know the last several weeks anyway. And um, so, one of the things that I realized that that there might by connecting with our our other sort of municipal agencies so be that in, in michigan oftentimes it's a township 
So by talking to um, my local city and township officials, one of the townships that we provide service to um, in talking to the township supervisor realized that he was really struggling with kind of figuring out what to do, realized he didn't really, and, and asking some pointed questions of him, I realized that he, well, he doesn't feel like he has much support and doesn't have the kind of infrastructure. And, and as I say, I've, I've felt really fortunate that in Michigan, we've had a good um, infrastructure kind of support system. And so, you know, I haven't really done much with, with him yet, but I've offered to start sharing some of what, you know, what we've been doing in terms of these, of these reopening plans. And so just by asking, by contacting some of these folks and just asking the questions about, you know, so what, what is it that you're, who, what is your support system? You know, who, who do you consult when you're trying to figure out, you know, what you at the township level are going to do or, you know, and sometimes folks don't, they might not have that at all. And so I, I'm not even altogether sure what I will have to offer him that'll end up being helpful. I have some ideas and I'm going to schedule another meeting with him soon. But just by contacting these folks and asking the questions sometimes can help and inviting sort of the, okay, what is it? And I oftentimes find out that's that's helpful is whoever it is in our community that we're, we're trying to do outreach and, and trying to connect with is just by a, simply asking the question, you know, what is it that you need? What What is it that would be helpful to you? And just a very informal way sometimes is enough to start the conversations that lead to things that we can do that are helpful. That's great. There's been a lot of stuff in the chat. I know Kate uh, mentioned that the um, Library 2.0 is going to be having the mini conference on June the 17th that's being sponsored by, um, I guess, Arsenal has a partnership, um, TechSoup and San Jose State University Library School. Um, so you should definitely look into signing up for that if you haven't already and you have the time. Um, Don mentioned putting up sign, or making signs for the businesses to post about being a supporter of the library. And Patty mentioned um, taking care of yourself and, and doing some kind of self-care. I know we're getting towards the close of the hour. And I know nem has got a lot of sort of housekeeping stuff to, to do, talking about um, some changes with the Arcel website and um, some other things. So if anybody, if no one has anything else that they're really burning to talk about, although I do see Jennifer looks like a scavenger hunt in here, which sounds kind of interesting. Um, do you want to talk about that, Jennifer, real quick before we switch over to Nem? All right, maybe Jennifer can get unmuted. Nem, do you want to take over and talk about um, everything? This has been a really great hour and everybody's got so many great ideas. This is a this is a really tough one trying to come up with ways to serve people who may not have the technology or the access. Yeah, so um, this is uh, the last time that we'll be doing a weekly um, roundtable. From now on, we, we will be doing it every two weeks. And so I think the next roundtable will be on June 11th. Um, we don't have a topic for that yet. And so if you have a topic that you are really interested in seeing, um, put it in the chat, or you can always email us at info at arsl.org. Um, also, we, if you're interested in facilitating one, I'd love to get in touch with you. We can get we can get you with a co-facilitator. Um, it's not a hard job as people come with their own questions and their own um, really great ideas. Um, another thing that I wanted to bring up is that we uh, this week launched the new ARSL website. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys have seen that yet, um, it's uh, pretty exciting, really cool. Um, and if you have any problems with your membership, trying to log in, trying to renew, if the expiration date is wrong, 
um, email me at that uh, email as well, and then I can help you with that as well. Uh, other than that, uh, thanks for coming. I'll hand it back to CL. Excuse me. All right, well, I guess we'll just close out the hour then. Um, thank you all so much for participating. It's been a great discussion. Do you have anything final that you want to say, Clancy? Uh, just before the noon siren goes off and my dog howls, I just thank everyone and I encourage you to give being a facilitator a try. It isn't like you're teaching the class. It's, you know, have a few ideas and a few questions planned and think how great it will look on your resume or when you do your employee evaluations. <laughs> And I just thank everyone for participating. All right, thank you all. And we'll see you back in two weeks, hopefully. Thank you all very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone.